Today, we're going to talk about decentralized finance and really understand a little bit more about how this could be helping you in your crypto journey, a little bit of education, really outlining the projects, uh, some of the risk, and also just in general, some of the framework of how DeFi is utilized in the crypto markets. I know a lot of people, maybe you've never done anything in DeFi, never looked at yield farming, any of those kind of things. Hopefully today we'll get a chance to kind of dive into some of those to help you out and get in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Uh, before we get started today, I do want to thank our sponsors, and that is iTrust Capital. Of course, if you're looking at long-term holds, uh, and I think a lot of our audience looks at this kind of approach toward your crypto strategies, uh, st doing something inside an IRA is a great solution. And it is one way that you can get, of course, uh, into not only a better tax position, but also uh, have the ability to really have a lot of flexibility within the IRA itself. I Trust Capital does a great job. And of course, there's no monthly fees uh, and it's a, like a 1% trading fee. So it's really easy. Lots of tokens. You can also go into gold and silver. Tons of stuff available over there on iTrust Capital. What I would suggest that you do, sign up with our link below and you'll get a $100 funding reward. It's just that simple. Let's get into it today a little bit. And uh, decentralized finance, I think, you know, for the most part has had both a high and low within the market. And we continue to see a variety of different scenarios that have played out in this, sometimes in the negative light when you look at things that happened around Celsius and even to a certain extent uh, what happened over at Voyager. But what I think a lot of people are starting to realize, and if you guys remember, our CPI, our own power index, we do a sentiment ranking on uh, decentralized finance as the whole. And basically what we do is take a lot of the DeFi projects that are listed on CoinMarketCap, CoinGecko, and we harvest against those in terms of general sentiment. So a lot of times what I'll do is I use a tool uh, out there in the marketplace called Masari. And it is a, a tool that I use mostly for research. And I thought we've had Ryan uh, Selkis on the show before. We thought, let's get, uh, let's get some more uh, names over here to kind of get an idea of not only what's happening in De DeFi, but also maybe how this might work for you. So I want to welcome in uh, Dustin Tiander, who is a researcher over there at Masari. Great to have you on, Dustin. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. On. Excellent. So Dustin, let's first, for, there are uh, some of our audience, and I think for the most part, un unless you're an, an advanced crypto user and investor, many people may not even know who Masari is. So first of all, frame up Masari, what you guys do, what's your core mission over mm -hmm. here? Yeah, no, Masari is actually one of like the leading providers in, in crypto for like, for data as well as top tier research firms. So we write up a lot of kind of the industry leading research around you know, what's going on in the market, what to look for. If you're an investor, kind of like, you know, what, what trends should you be paying attention to? What tokens be paying attention to? And really like parsing out all that deep data that's really tough to get actually uh, within crypto. I was looking at your, your website um, and I just got a chance to actually read this state of life here uh, last, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, or this morning. Um, and some of these reports are, a little bit deeper dive. And then you have a lot of, you know, more of the, you know, blog oriented type of research. Um, I'm just kind of curious when, when you guys, cause you guys publish a lot of content uh, around this. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's more popular right now? Are you finding more people looking for reports or do you pe see people more on the kind of the more news oriented uh, content and commentary that your researchers do? Um, it's a little bit of both. I think what we're seeing right now, like particularly like as we've come come down on the market, is more of you know kind of what's next, right? What is what are like right. the big trends happening, and less of yeah. um, you know previous reports. So really, it's really looking for like what's that next thing and they pull you out of the bear market. What's the kind of the new upcoming projects, if you will? Yeah, yeah. So kind of the discovery phase, which is really kind of that that happens with us as well. Uh, anytime we have mm -hmm. like a new breaking you know, analysis on any hot topic or token, um, those seem to always get a lot more clicks and a lot more views in terms of both on our Diamond Circle, which is our membership uh, program. Let's get into uh, cash flow because this is a, a problem and liquidity in general has been a bit of a challenge within DeFi as a whole. When you mm -hmm. look at on-chain uh, native cash flows, really um, from a circulation speculation approach, what are some of the things mm -hmm. you guys look for in uh, a DeFi project to really kind of establish if it's got enough support there from a liquidity standpoint? 
really you're looking at like I guess more of the quality of the revenue, right? So like in DeFi, you got to understand like, you know, where you're getting the revenue matters a lot. So mm -hmm. um, if it's DEX trades, right, you can maybe rely on that a little bit more. Again, it's very cyclical um, to the speculative environment. So if you've got a high speculative environment, you're going to see higher DEX revenues and stuff like this. Um, additionally, you can get revenue from, you know, the lending platform. So like an Aave, a Maker, uh, things like this, they're making loans, right? So yeah. When loans popular, that's also again from a speculative manner. Um, so again, it's very DeFi revenue is very cyclical. So what you're really looking for is kind of more of the quality of revenue, and is is this thing going to last? Right? Is it going to be here the next cycle or or right. whatever? Um, so and there's, and there's different revenue models. Like going back again to the the interest revenue. That's actually like even a it's hard to compete away, right? So with DEX models, right. you can maybe launch a new DEX and, and lower the fee um, with, um, you know, as you've got interest revenues, like you can't just copy and paste code and, and take that interest revenue. So those are a yeah. little bit higher quality revenue, which we like. So, okay, so in evaluating the number of DeFi projects out there um, in mm -hmm. the space itself, you look at, you know, there's many types of, uh, of applications that are obviously trying to create and improve their revenue mm -hmm. quality. That's kind of one of the holy grails of what DeFi has done. I mean, we've seen this everything from Aave Curve, etc. If you look at um, the different kind of revenue models that are in DeFi, which one would you say is one maybe a little bit more long term? You know, in the essence of these mm -hmm. these types of projects are going to be around because of this kind of revenue model that they're focusing on. To me, it's really the stablecoin models, right? So let's, okay. you know, pick on Maker. They've been very successful at this. So Maker, they've got the DAI token, which, you know, they're generating probably one from a DeFi perspective, some of the top bottom, you know, bottom line revenue in the market. And why are they able to do that? Because they've got, essentially, they own um, the asset that people are borrowing. So right. the, like an Aave, to compare it, is people have to deposit in USDC and then people borrow that capital. Well, Aave's mm -hmm. got to pay those depositors interest rates. So that takes a huge cut out of the margin. So instead of for maker, right, they just print new die. And that's a that's a huge game changing business model, right? Because now right. all that interest revenue goes right to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, like we've seen stablecoin liquidity essentially be like kind of the prime need within DeFi as well. So as you project out the growth of these ecosystems, we're going to need certain levels of essentially stablecoin liquidity just to keep them, you know, stable in general. Um, so as you project out that growth and you project out the interest revenues on top of that, uh, we do see that as like one of the prime uh, business models for DeFi. I was going into uh, kind of the business model convergence, just some things that we had in our show notes um, in terms of which tokens or projects have the best liquidity, especially from a stable po uh, coin aspect um, mm -hmm. and fee revenue model. You're saying that anything that is true, I guess, one-to-one -one stable coin uh, is really the better solution to take or at least look at in terms of, you know, if you're selecting a platform out there. Are there any within the stable coin realms themselves, because you obviously could go into Tether, you know, PAX, obviously mm -hmm. with USDC, et cetera, any that you guys are looking at that, uh, you feel have performed a bit better than others? I think USDC is honestly, you know, the growth that you saw essentially all the way through uh, DeFi summer has been quite impressive, right? You saw very yeah. little amount of USDC. Now it's, you know, what second largest stable coin, 50 billion or so. Um, and it's not just the size that matters, right? It's, it's how it gets used. So Tether mm -hmm. is a larger market cap token, right? But it's a lot of it is, um, highly inside of centralized exchanges, right? So what does that mean? It means it's basically using the fund liquidity for trading pairs inside of Binance, FTX, right. et cetera, um, versus USDC is actually very, very active inside of DeFi itself. You'll actually see USDC volumes ex extraordinarily see Tether volumes. Um, Interesting. And that's, that's yeah, it's, uh, if you, I would honestly say USDC is the prime stable coin of DeFi um, currently, yeah. Yeah. I like um, the fact that when you do understand or, or start to look at these as potential opportunities and you kind of compare, because I think a lot of our audience looks at, well, hey, Paul, why couldn't we just go over to Binance and, you know, stake and earn a yield interest? Mm -hmm. It's a very simple way to do it in comparison to doing more of a risk approach toward a DeFi entry. 
How would you answer that question? Because there are there's two different strategies here from a retail investor versus a you know maybe a more high line investor. What do you feel are you know I guess the best approach there versus those two types of options? With this, with the centralized, you know, let's take Binance. You know, Binance is very trustworthy, but like even to look yeah. at Celsius or something like this, right? You're taking a lot of risk, which you don't really know what's happening, right? You're staking with Celsius, and you're earning seven whatever percent it is. You don't really know how they're getting that, right? And you're inheriting a lot of that risk. Versus when you go into DeFi, you actually are kind of like the controller of your own destiny, right? For better, for worse. Um, and that aspect, I think, I, you do like a lot, right? And there's additional benefits as well, right? It's not that you can understand the risk that you're taking and, and kind of plot out exactly what we're doing. But, you know, you know, there's famous airdrops and all sorts of stuff that go on, right? Ancillary benefits of essentially, you know, being the one that controls uh, where you deposit, what tokens you hold, how you trade, et cetera, right? There's a lot of almost additional opportunities that you are missing by just being on the centralized exchanges. In addition to just general market intelligence, as you, do conduct on-chain activity you're going to learn okay you know this is the place to be these have the best yields and right and that tangentially can inform investment decisions as well i was looking at this story right here and this one is um bitcoin can solve the DeFi onboarding crisis uh and they make the the position that you know bitcoin and this is a problem right now with with i think not only onboarding, just in general, let's say it's brand, somebody mm-hmm. brand new to DeFi. And there are challenges there because they do have to kind of jump through some hoops to get that done. Mm-hmm. And if you look at, at the potential of where Bitcoin could play into this, do you feel that that is a reality or do you think that's more of pie in the sky opportunity? It's really, I don't think it's that much of a reality. I mean, it, mm-hmm. I do think it is the kind of people's first foray into crypto, if you will, um, is Bitcoin. But like as you start thinking about DeFi, it's just actually really tough to get true native Bitcoin on DeFi, yeah. right? It's yeah. it is kind of isolated, and you do accept a lot of risk if that's what you want to do. Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't know if I agree that you know Bitcoin is going to be the thing that drives people into DeFi, uh, particularly from a retail audience perspective. Um, what? But there, don't do get me think, wrong. There's definitely developments on that side. Go ahead. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there are. Um, what do you think will be a better solution? especially to onboarding the average investor? Because there are a lot of people before they ever even discover DeFi. I mean, you have to go through a lot within the crypto community. Yeah. You're, you're learning about a wallet, you're learning about centralized exchanges, then decentralized exchanges. Then all of a sudden you discover DeFi and you know yield farming and all these different tool sets that are out there. What would be some of the things that when you guys study these at the level that you do, that you think would be better for a new user to be able to one understand it and then two be able to execute on it mm-hmm. what are some of the things that you think need to improve from an improvement it's just the user onboarding experience i mean it, it, having to learn what a wallet is download it you know you always got to use your web browser like it's just right. a really clunky experience in my opinion uh, if you look at what coinbase and doing there's a couple others um all trying to roughly kind of get at this um uh, essentially create that user experience up front like wrap this in a really slick mobile nice user experience, do a lot of the key wallet management kind of behind the scenes, if you will. And then, you know, again, behind the scenes, like you're depositing in Aave, you're depositing in a maker, you're you're allowing users to like use Uniswap, uh, invest in NFTs, all of these kind of things, but doing it in one place and like a kind of a unified user experience. I do think, you know, stuff like that and like making crypto really approachable, right? I think making crypto approachable to the, you know, retail, yeah. even professional audience, is like going to be one of the key unlocks that we're going to see over the next couple of years, right? Because For sure. The available user base is going to grow, you know, by multiples. Yeah. Do you think the educational aspect is going to need to take leaps and bounds forward? Or do you think that's just going to be an inherent element that eventually is going to be like almost like any other financial instrument out there? It, it gets to a point where people will understand it. You know, they start to accept it. What are your thoughts there? I think I think it's actually just going to be it just happens, right? I mean, it's yeah. very music. It's going to be like using a banking app. It's going to be like yeah. you, you shouldn't know how the yield is generated, who's borrowing exactly. what, right? The same if you invest in Exxon, you don't know how to go, you know, drill for oil, right? Um, I think it's just going to be very easy, like deposit money here, earn X yield, and right. what the DeFi apps will do is just do all that stuff on the back end. 
Talk to me about some of the revenue models that could be utilized by these platforms in the future, because I, I still always wonder whether or not these are sustainable. It's just like with, if you just go look, and we have this happen all the time, uh, we saw this just uh, this week on some centralized exchanges where they were dropping yields on USDC, or in essence, GUSD, it was Gemini. Uh, but they were coming down off of like 75 down to 5.5%. And I continuously see that, even with USDC Enterprise, you know, we've saw uh, a big drop in the amount of yields that they're paying out, uh, even if you're just looking at staking USDC over on, um, you know, a USDC Enterprise-style account. With that being the case, where are the revenues going to come from in the future for these DeFi platforms? Because I think that will establish which ones are probably going to do better than others. Yeah, this is actually one thing I think about a lot, actually, is because, you know, we kind of touched on this at the top of the show. Essentially, mm-hmm. where they're making the money right now is very, like, speculated driven, right? So it's highly dependent on people taking out leverage, buying tokens, et cetera, yeah. right? Um, we need to kind of move into a world where you actually do have, like, real economic activity, right? Exchanging goods for services. So once you get, like, some on-chain cash flow, if you will, you really do unlock kind of that next wave of, you know, DeFi, you can do under collateralized lending, you can do recommendation systems, all sorts of things. So to me, it's almost looking so smidge outside of DeFi and saying, okay, what's that next layer of applications that can essentially drive revenues back into DeFi, right? It's, you've seen with Solana, they've launched like Solana Pay that allows like merchants to accept USDC payments or right. a variety of tokens, do loyalty programs, right? That's going to bring more revenue into DeFi that then will kind of come out on the back end that we kind of just talked about um into some of these other providers right because now you've got more liquidity you can get more borrowers etc right so that's where all the revenue is going to come from is essentially from a tangential um to DeFi, and then DeFi will be kind of the beneficiary um from these additional um sectors of growth if you will yeah so i, I think that's uh it's going to be really critical for at least on the growth side of things what would keep the DeFi platforms themselves from launching their own chains and really kind of expanding that as an opportunity for them in terms of revenue. I think that's actually going to happen, you know, just down the line. I don't think, you know, they should happen immediately, right? Because the big challenge there is now user acquisition. You know, um, right. if you're not on your own chain, right, you're on Ethereum or wherever, right, you've got a whole bucket of users, right? You've got mm-hmm. not just retail users, but even other um, smart contracts or DeFi protocols can now use your application, right? So, you know, throwing that all away uh, just for a little bit of value accrual and stuff, uh, I don't think is like kind of the optimal strategy, particularly at this point in the growth cycle. I think what you're gonna do is you're gonna see these, you know, applications kind of over the next couple of years, get that really deep, um, call it brand recognition, you know, revenue commitments, all these sorts of things, partnerships, et cetera. And then once you've kind of already got that locked in, now you can make that decision into like, okay, let's go launch our own chain. Right. Uh, launch our own roll up, whatever it is. And then that's that's when you can accrue a, another layer of value as well, right? Outside of just pure um, DeFi revenues. Yeah, I think uh, the key here is, again, back to the whole point is uh, whether or not this gets enough, you know, legs under to really start to accelerate. Because in these crypto winters, this is typically where we see a lot of, you know, kind of downturns, whether or not the protocol even makes it, you know, scenarios like that really kind of play into it. Uh, another area that I wanted to touch on, and this is the user experience side of things uh, more so. We kind of kind of talked a little bit about it because what would it take to really kind of amp it up? Mm-hmm. Of the ones that are out there right now, is it, when you do the research, you really take a look and a deep dive within whether it's Maker, Curve, or you know Ave, etc. Which one of these or of these do you see any kind of rising out of the the current pack? that are starting to really understand this user experience and doing a better job? I think it's, I'm going to give you two answers. I think it's, uh, and it, they're both like top DeFi protocols. Uh, so Uniswap is one that I, you know, they're, they've taken an approach of giving, they've acquired an NFT platform, right? An right. NFT aggregator actually, right? So what they're trying to do is give that DeFi user, right now it's very fractured, right? You got to know to go to these different exchanges to do these different things, right? Uh, Uniswap is actually like kind of bringing all that uh, to their place. customer, right? And they yeah. and they really understand like you know for them to make go to that next level, whether it's revenue or just you know company position, and everything they know it's not going to be from creating a more efficient DEX, right? I mean, what are you going to get a little bit more efficiencies and learn to drive the next ten x of growth, right? So 
what they understand is that it's the approachability of crypto that's like going to be the key, you know, factor in their in their growth pattern. So, and they they've got a lot of developments I think under the way of really addressing that and really making crypto more approachable. Whether that's making a wallet, whether that's making uh, just unifying the front end and everything, just to make it a lot more approachable. And you think about who that next customer is, it's like they're going to be less crypto native, right? Mm-hmm. So you need it to be far more approachable even than that it is now. Um, and then the second one would be Aave. So Aave, they've done a lot on the efficiency side, but now they've kind of got launching a lot of these like sort of tangential businesses to make their product, you know, even better, right? So they're launching kind of a decentralized social network, which are going to allow people to, again, like do typical social media stuff, like post and stuff, but then you can also earn, right? So you're earning off of your content. That's another like really powerful user experience for people to have. And then also kind of use Aave as your bank account or even like kind of as a, your loan platform, et cetera. Um, so almost bringing more services to the customer, right? That they just can't get somewhere else and tying that back into the, your core offering, which is, you know, the Aave lending platform. Yeah. Um, I do like a lot, right? I was looking at your own uh, top T, uh, top ten fee generating protocols, and to your point, Uniswap kind of leads the way right there. You can kind of see just on the thirty day fees mm-hmm. where they are, uh, and then you look at their growth. I mean, even in the uh, thirty, ninety, and one eighty, I mean, they seem to really be accelerating here. Do you feel that it is just the product layer, or do you think Uniswap is just uh, slowly acquiring? kind of defectors from other, you know, from other DeFi platforms. What do you, where do you think the growth is coming from? Cause that's kind of an odd growth cycle there. It is, it is. Uh, it's, I think it's, you're just seeing consolidation more or less, right? You know, over yeah. the, the big bull market, right? You, people are trying all these different decks again, to try to find, get airdrops. Maybe they're looking, trying to trade some obscure token, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. What you're kind of seeing now is everyone kind of rushing back to safety, if you will, especially after, you know, the Celsius and et cetera. Um, I do think it's a little bit more of like now like kind of finding who your core customer is and like yeah. really building that like kind of like trust. So like I think what you're seeing is just leaving other exchanges that um, not really yeah, necessary Unis- right now. I was looking at the list here. Uniswap, uh, obvious, obvious growth. And, and we know the scenario with OpenSea, but you got Lido in there. But mm-hmm. even with Lido Finance, uh, which has been somewhat of the, the winner on ETH2, um, and then you kind of flow on down all the way into con, uh, Convex Finance, Aave, et cetera, even GMX. What about DYDX? They're in the midst of, of flipping over to a Cosmos ecosystem. Have you heard about this mm-hmm. with them? Well, yeah. Where do you think that one will, will end up? Because we've had them on our show before. What are your thoughts on them? I'm just kind of curious. Are they a, a black horse in the race? I do like them a lot. I mean, they're, so they're, as we talked about user experience, like they probably have one of the by far as slick as used experience from a DeFi app. Uh, and that's, that's really key, but you know, and they'll need that, right? Because one of the biggest challenges is going to your own chains. What we've mentioned is actually acquiring those users, right? So now, you know, if you look at the active users within, you know, Ethereum and kind of an Ethereum ecosystem, it's fairly high, right? Relatively, right. And you look at Cosmos is actually fairly low, right? So you're really be- making a big bet that, Hey, your users are going to follow you. Um, and they probably will, right? And they might. Uh, just because the user experience is, you know, kind of that notch up from what you can get on, you know, a variety of other ecosystems. So I do like it. I do also like from the revenue side, you also got to look at uh, the incentives, right? That's a big thing that I always like to look at from a, like a tokenomic perspective. So right. even if you are making millions in uh, revenue, like how much are you paying to get that revenue? And that's always a, yeah. a key, key question. Uh, so for DUIDX, they are paying out a, a fair amount of incentives essentially to acquire that revenue. If you kind of look mm-hmm. at uh, when the trading fees and kind of when that revenue is acquired, it's very cyclical to when the um, uh, incentive distributions go out. So uh, that that is like a point of concern, right, is if you kind of do move and lower those incentives, right, does the revenue stay? How sticky is that right. revenue? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that will be. But again, it, it'll it'll tell quickly of whether or not they have been able to mm-hmm. get real users, you know, in into the mm-hmm. platform itself. That kind of goes into your uh, chart right here, which is the top ten protocols by token incentives issued. Uh, which is back to your point, large incentive programs which dilute, you know, the existing token holders, uh, and it does create, you know, the sell pressure, which is what has been the scenario mm-hmm. there. But again. If you look at, uh, like your point, uh, you had Pocket Network here leading the way, but DYDX was, uh, yeah, right there, uh, number four. 
mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the 30-day uh, incentives. But if you go into the all the way out to the 180, then it goes into pocket curve, synthetics, DYDX still on the top end here. Mm -hmm. And I think the and there's you know you get into some of the NFT st uh, stuff. Um, and I think the point here to all of our listeners, viewers is when you're getting ready to step into DeFi, you know, definitely do your homework. That is one of the things you you definitely have to go into. Uh, and, I, you know, the, the point behind researching these networks, and again, I think to what, um, you know, Masari is talking about here is uh, the fact that you have to understand where those revenues are coming from because it does make a lot more sense for you on the backside as to whether or not this is a long-term, uh, you know, play for you. So... Love to get you guys' feedback. Make sure and hit like on the video. It's another uh, area that we love to kind of, whether you like these kinds of educational pieces like this or uh, you're looking for more token analysis. I know everybody's always pushing for that. Uh, I want to get into regulation because this is a big one around DeFi. Mm. And it is, you know, this is going to, I think more and more people are, are everybody's kind of concerned a bit, a bit about it. Obviously, mm -hmm. even more so probably than uh, regulation over some of the, you know, security uh, securities that may be deemed securities out there right now. How do you see uh, this playing out within the regulatory landscape? Well, it's really tough to say how exactly they're going to regulate it. Um, but the way I really honestly don't know if it's actually going to matter in the long term, right? It's certainly going to be like um, a, a quick hit. But to me, like it actually is a good thing, right, that we get regulation because Right now, you got a lot of people on the sidelines kind of looking and even asking, like, am I allowed to touch this stuff? Can I invest in it? Can I even go into DeFi, et cetera, yeah. right? There's, there's such a large question that, like, keeps a lot of people on the sidelines. So once you get a little bit of the regulatory clarity, uh, I do think you kind of honestly unlock kind of another set of participants, particularly, like, mm -hmm. professional participants as well, yeah. right? Um, even to invest, like, down, down the risk curve as well, right? A lot of them kind of can find into Bitcoin. Ethereum, et cetera, they don't really know if, you know, some of these DeFi tokens are securities, et cetera, right? So having that regulatory clarity, um, no matter what it is, I do actually like, you know, the industry might get scared for, you know, a short period of time, but like, I do think you're going to see, you know, even shortly while after realize like, okay, you know what, this is actually a net good, right? Because we know kind of what we're standing up against essentially. And it sort of also opens up a lot of doors. It might close a door too, but I think it will open up. Um, yeah. a fair amount of doors that we can sort of underappreciate. Well, I think any kind of regulation that at least showcases the point to where now we understand the rules, I think that's you mm -hmm. know obviously good for any investment instrument out there, especially for markets if we're going to grow within some of these markets because it will flush out you know a lot of the gamblers, yes, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also going to bring in a lot more of the systematic, you know, investment capital that is looking for long-term play, uh, plays in these markets, which I think mm -hmm. is a, it's a good thing overall, I think, for crypto in general. When you look at uh, tokens and projects within DeFi to, let's just say, are on the fence. We won't say they're bad or they're good, mm -hmm. but ones that need improvement that should, we should look at and say, these have play, they, there's some potential here, but they need some improvement. Is there anything that sticks out to you right now? I think more on the security side of front. So meaning, are you taking in revenue and are you distributing that back to token holders? That's a, that's right. going to be a key question. Now it's a double-edged sword because if you're a token holder, you would like the revenues, right? Mm. Uh, however, that does open you up to more securities laws, right? So now it's, you know, a lot more attackable essentially from a securities angle. Um, yeah. And like those are always kind of, you want to be, you take on a little bit more risk, right? I mean, you are getting more benefit. You are getting the revenue um, generation, but you aren't, you are taking more of the regulatory risk with that as well. Uh, so that's always something to be mindful of as you're like, you know, looking for different tokens to invest in, right? So, you know, Uniswap, for example, doesn't distribute revenue to token holders, right? right. Particularly for this reason. Uh, mm -hmm. The regulatory risk is far too high relative to the gain. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Hence why you see, you know, Uniswap, the token, obviously doing some interesting things right now on the charts. And it's been, you know, it's had, mm -hmm. it gets its gains for sure. Obviously it gets its dips, but, uh, if you're watching closely what, what's happening over there. And then at the same time, you've got, you know, other projects out there we've seen and looked at. We've had the team on from AMP a couple of times that kind of go mm -hmm. in that direction. Um, in terms of the best uh, DeFi tokens to stake, if you're thinking about because there's a mm -hmm. lot of different staking tools out there within it. Any of those that you say, hey, these are some of the top uh, tokens that we would we would look at for staking purposes. For staking purposes, you are like taking a lot of 
call it like you're investing in a token as well, right? You're holding it, right? So like right. for me, I like, you know, again, looking, going back to Aave for a lot of stuff that we've talked about on the show uh, about like kind of the DeFi, you know, business models, right? They're going to be launching their own stable coin here shortly. Right. And that's going to be a, a basically a boon to their revenue, right? You look at their mm -hmm. uh, even Q2 revenues, right? They would have had a stable coin at roxy a billion dollars, right? They would have roughly 10x or, or whatever it is, uh, their quarterly revenue. So, you know, you add that kind of like a growth pattern in there, you you kind of add in some of the other stuff they're doing ancillary to the business, whether it's the social media um, right. and a variety of other little things they've got going on. Um, you know, when you do stake with Aave, you're, you're making more Aave as well. It's like you do, you know, like you are taking risk of backstopping the protocol as well. But uh, in terms of from like DeFi tokens that you can actually stake and, and earn something from, um, I think Aave does make like at least a decent amount of sense uh, given one, the risks that you're taking as well as kind of the, the growth profile. Um, yeah, that's, those are all things to consider. And then if you want to get outside of DeFi tokens, uh, the Lido ecosystem, I think is, Lido, is pretty good yeah. if you're looking to take, um, just Ethereum and stake Ethereum, right? You don't want to take mm -hmm. the DeFi token risk. It's actually a little bit easier just to take, um, Ethereum and deposit in Lido. Yeah. I was looking, uh, this was an article here on forecast. Uh, Ethereum merge be a big game changer, obviously for DeFi and crypto, and we've seen that. You know, obviously uh, Lido Lido uh, has has really kind of shown, uh, obviously some very serious growth over a short period of time. So it's definitely one that we talk about here in the show a lot. Justin, let's talk about the uh, last thing to you, and that's uh, to talk about some of these bridge hacks that have just occurred. Obviously, mm -hmm. Binance just reported one yesterday. Uh, another monster to the space did happen in the bridge ecosystem for BNB. How safe are these platforms that are utilizing these bridges that enable kind of this exposure in the market? Because this, of course, is being done in DeFi quite a bit. How does this? How do you think this is going to play out in terms of security aspects, and whether or not we're going to see any kind of improvements here? I mean, I surely hope we see some improvements. There are definitely some projects like tackling this problem. Um, yeah. And I, I do think bridging is probably one of the top things that, um, you know, that kind of like sticks out of the industry and yeah. particularly like from a user experience standpoint. So there's a couple different angles, right? We talked in the, uh, earlier in the show about like, you know, these front ends sort of wrapping in DeFi. So like take Coinbase, for example, if they could sort of become uh, this platform and you can still stay, you can still deposit an Aave and stuff. You know, Coinbase right. is going to take a lot of that risk themselves, and right, they'll have professionals that really know how to manage that and assess that risk on the on the side. Whereas, use on the user side, don't have to worry about it as much, and that's one angle. Um, like on a pure technology perspective, you know, we kind of touched on DYDX moving to Cosmos. You know, Cosmos right. has got like a an interesting like bridge, you know, system where um, the trust is minimized a, a touch, right? As well as um, if you think about how Ethereum scaling from going into L2s, Arbitrum, um, mm -hmm. Optimism, et cetera, yeah. even Starkware. Um, if you, I, you know, probably in like a couple of years, we'll see what we'll call layer threes. So yeah. uh, what you can do for, with, with that, right, you're gonna have bridging basically all happen on the layer two and all in a very safe manner, right? So you're not really going in between these disparate ecosystems, right? Going from a layer one to another layer one is always really, really tough, right? You're inheriting a ton of risk where there's, we're working on a lot of different sort of architecture models, if you will, that kind of are going to meditate this stuff in the future. And I do think um, it's definitely something I think this industry is taking serious on both on the kind of the user experience side, whether you're like a Coinbase or whether um, you're a builder and, and designing some of these protocols. Last couple of questions for you, then we'll jump to our poll. And that is uh, NFTs and DeFi. Is there anything that sticks out for you? And then also gaming tokens. How do you see those playing into the DeFi future? So for DeFi, I like, I think we've already kind of sort of touched on Aave a smidge. Um, I do like any protocols that earning revenue and big earning revenue to the bottom line, right? So Maker, Aave, et cetera. Um, and also like what, uh, Uniswap has gone essentially on the NFT, NFT side. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen NFT volumes go dramatically down, but like right. we probably expect that to come back, right? So with Uniswap as being like an aggregator, owning kind of the DEX share as well. That's um, a good point. That's a, that's a good, that's a growth angle as well, right? So yeah. um, we definitely see that sort of happening. And then from gaming is is the tough one to tackle, right? We've seen the boom and bust cycle of essentially Axie Infinity, Stefan, um, a couple of these others, a new one on Nier, 
Um, I do think we're going to see like a renaissance sort of in gaming, but I don't think it's oh, going to no. be quite as soon as people would think, right? I mean, there's yeah. a lot of hype around the industry right now of, you know, maybe gaming is the next thing, metaverse, et cetera, throws buzzwords out there. Um, but it's just really, really tough to do, particularly when you bring the tokens inside of the game. And that's, mm-hmm. to me, that's always been a pivotal point, right? We see all Axe Infinity, Stefan, et cetera, like make the game items investable. And that's really tough to make it sustainable in the long term, in my opinion, right? You're opening yourself up to a lot of like open market operations. Right. And it's just really tough. So I think from a gaming perspective, like it's honestly going to be maybe one of the most simple games that are going to, what we're going to see first. Um, yeah. Just because of the complexities minimized and the risk is minimized. Yeah, um, for sure. And I but think, it, you know, it won't cover... be until, go ahead. Go ahead. You were going to, no, I was just going to say like the real, the real sort of games and meta- metaversity buzzwords. I don't think you're going to see that for at least two, three, four years um, until we work out like a lot of the interoperability um, challenges. Yeah, I think the, you know, we have a lot of game devs on and, you know, they within their roadmap, typically I see that uh, when we see, and they are typically 2024, 2025 mm-hmm. roadmaps out there. But again, remember game, get, game devs work on a completely different timetable than a mm-hmm. lot of people because they're looking at really five, seven, eight years uh, for full game development of these projects. And if you guys know gaming and you've watched some of our shows, you understand how that works. Hopefully, this has helped you guys a little bit on a takeaway. I think even I learned some things about really digging down into the DeFi uh, revenue mechanisms because I think that is one of the things that uh, you guys can do today very easily. Just start going and doing the research on these platforms, digging into their revenue mechanisms and understand how they do contribute those revenues back in. Uh, and, and you know, to a certain extent, hopefully that's going to help you. The other aspect is uh, really get into the user experience because I think those are the ones that have really, one, they're investing time. And those are going to be the ones that I think are the sleepers because of the fact that they have really cool user experiences, very slick. When we see a, a, a true... Um, comeback of not only the crypto markets, you're going to be bringing a lot of new investors in and a lot of people who have never even touched DeFi. So whoever wins that race, when that occurs, you might be in a uh, one of those right positions uh, with one of these platforms that uh, could be ready to pop any any moment, much like Uni- uh, Uniswaps has done you know, mm-hmm. here recently, yeah. where they've kind of really, you know, just won the, the race here in terms of the local audience around crypto that kind of understand it, but they see that as such a great, you know, tool set. Let's jump over to the poll real quick, and then we'll take a couple of questions here. Let's see here. All right. Are you currently participating in any of these? Staking, 68% of our audience is in there. Yield farming, a small percentage, and then I have no idea what those are. (laughs) So there you go. Uh, And liquidity mining, interesting, 3%. Uh, So staking is kind of the big, you know, it's the the big thing that I think everybody is looking at, mainly because you can do it on centralized exchanges. Finance obviously came out there, big program. Uh, Gemini's been doing it, and you know Coinbase to a certain extent. Obviously, ETH two played into that, so I would kind of agree with that. A couple of questions for you. Uh, let's go here with one coming from Jerry Crosby. Can staked ETH become larger than ETH? No. Hmm. Um, That's so. If, no, yeah. Uh, yeah so what even no. for staked ETH? Yeah, technically no, but uh, even just to answer even a little bit more detail, right? So staked ETH is actually Lido's token. And what the Lido community has kind of done, they've almost like sort of capped their growth, right? So where you look at their market share, roughly like 33% or so, and that's kind of the community sort of decided that's where they want to be. You know, if you get too far in market share, you kind of open yourself up to a lot of risk. And the community up to this point is at least has kind of made that decision to stay around that and incentivize more in that 33% zone and not go too much higher. Cypher King coming in with, what do you think about staking on uh, Cake on PancakeSwap? Well, we just saw the Binance bridge hack, right? So you do take a little bit of risk by like getting over to the ecosystem. Um, But if you do, so Pancake, if you you go back to some of the revenue charts that we pulled up earlier, uh, PancakeSwap is like, you know, one of the top, you know, revenue earning protocols, but mm-hmm. uh, back to the regulation comment as well, they, they are returning that revenue to their stakers, right? So you open yourself up to, at least in the US, um, potential security laws, right? Like, I don't know how they're really gonna think about this from a regulatory standpoint, but you do accept a little bit more risk there and you're, you're likely compensated for that. 
Yeah, their pancake swap uh, on your report, the 30 day revenue, um, not necessarily that great compared to some of the others, but you got 60 day, 90 day revenue we've seen, uh, but they're in the, you know, they're still in the top three here uh, next to DYDX mm -hmm. and OpenSea. So, you know, in, in revenue producing protocol. So that might be something. Heel Doug comes in, uh, last question for you. Uh, why has Cardano been missing on Masari? <laughs> <laughs> we get this a lot on Twitter. Um, yeah. Well, it's really because it kind of comes down to like activity. Well, you know, really what we're looking at is like, you know, where were people transacting? Where are um, what's happening essentially on, yeah. you know, on each chain. of these platforms, right? You look at the, sure. the Ethereum on chain market is, you know, I want to say 30x larger than yeah, Cardano right robust. now. So like, yeah, very robust. It is. Now, as, now, as activity ha starts happening with Cardano, certainly we're, we're definitely covering. It's not like an active decision, like, no, we're not covering Cardano or anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a, we're really looking for the activity, right? So once that happens, right, you know, we had that hard fork, I think, pretty recently. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of hoping, like, maybe some activity comes from there. Maybe we get some more builders, you know, coming in and saying, like, okay, maybe this is an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but once we see that activity, then, then we'll probably see the coverage align with that. Yeah, very cool. Dustin, it's been great having you on. Uh, make sure and tell Ryan I said hello. Thanks a lot for uh, stopping <laughs> in today. We appreciate it. Will do. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. You bet. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things. When we do our audio versions of this, uh, you know, sometimes we're going into these charts. It's difficult to kind of get that into an audio format. I know the podcast is very popular and you guys love it because it's you know, much more mobile. But you really have to jump into the YouTube channel and make sure and subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Uh, also, another big feature that you should do is jump into the Diamond Circle. It's absolutely free. We've been dropping a lot more content. We just did a big Solana update and a Cosmos update in the Diamond Circle that normally that kind of content does not make it here onto the YouTube channel. So that's another reason you guys should get in there. It's absolutely free. Click the link below. And of course, if you guys want to reach me, it is out there on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.